Saudara Seusin Ali Tetamu kehormat Salam sejahtera kepada semua Saya terharu dengan sambutan begitu baik Maksudnya minat untuk meneruskan wacana tentang Raja-Raja Melayu itu masih segar Saya biasanya beritahu kepada Saudara Seusin Saya beri pidato dengan nota Tapi tidak ada teks tapi di kalangan saudara yang membaca dan meneliti itu mana laah buku ini tahu buku ini akan pastinya menarik perhatian dan mungkin juga akan digunakan oleh pihak-pihak tertentu khususnya utusan untuk menyerang oleh demikian saya memilih untuk melakar sedikit ucapan dan menyentuh uh, tajuk ini dan ada juga menyentuh tentang uh, sedikit tentang peranan saya. Now, gentlemen, ladies, uh, this is a booklet by general standards. A huge booklet perhaps, but still a small book. Said Hussein Ali is not competing on size here. If we accept that the qualities of a good political book must include clarity of writing, an interesting story or history to tell, bold assertions of facts, and most importantly, a no holds barred criticism of those considered to be above criticism, then there is no question that this book meets the test. Having had the privilege of reading it earlier, I can say that there are things said the, here about which many of us, if not all, wouldn't dare to say. Said Hussein is, as social scientists would like to say, sui generis. He is in a category of his own, unique in terms of moral conviction. He's not in the business of saying things to please people, and I know that for a fact. I may be biased, of course, having known him for so long as a lecturer, as a friend, a colleague, compatriot, and partisan too, for he had been in the senior party leadership. But let's put all these aside for those familiar with his writings will be able to tell you that there is an unbreakable chain in his overriding theme and that is the theme of social justice. And it is not just about welfare for the underprivileged or the economic position of the Malays or how real development should be given to the lower income group. No doubt, important issues that should never be ignored. But he goes beyond that into the realm of justice for those who have been unjustly treated, deep-seated inequality not just of material wealth, but societal inequality in terms of status. In this book, almost all the facts are in the public domain, but it is the manner in which Dr. Said Hussein has asserted them that makes the difference. In this regard, some controversy will be stirred, will stir up by those who are in the business of stirring up controversies. At page four, we get an immediate taste of the unapologetic approach to the author, of the author when he recounts an incident as told in Sejarah Melayu, the Malay Annals. This is the story of the son of Sultan Mansur Shah, Raja Muhammad, who killed the son of Tun Pera, Tun Besar. Well, he killed him because a ball that was kicked by Tun Besar had hit him on the head. Did Tun Pera keep quiet and just tell the matter to pass? He most certainly did not. As the most famous Prime Minister in the Malay Annals, he was not about to suffer in silence. So he proclaimed, the Malay slave is never disloyal, but we should not have this prince as our master. Consequently, he was not allowed to succeed his father. This is not a story about disloyalty or treason, but story about a Prime Minister who had the courage to stand up to the ruler in the face of oppression and injustice. But one must not forget 
that it is also a story about the sense of justice and fairness of the Sultan. The cruelty was committed not by him, but his heir. And by stripping his son of his position, the Sultan allowed justice to prevail. As the title of the book suggests, it is about the rulers and the Malay states. But what is even more telling is the subhead, regression or fall. The focus, therefore, is very much also on the Malay feudal system. We know where the author is going when, uh, when he refers to the existence of slave psychology among the people. He uses this term interchangeably with psychological servitude as well as slave mentality. And by his analysis, this phenomenon is buttressed by the such concepts as loyalty and treason, as in Satya and Darhaka. According to Dr. Said Hussein, this slave mentality is manifested by the hierarchical terms of address, customs related to the palace, and the psychological attitude that influences the relationship between the ruler and the people. These are outdated terms of address, and while linguistic changes cannot be achieved by mere legislation, Dr. Said Hussein advocates the democratization of the spoken language when addressing the ruler. The leaders must set the example. It's easy for him because he doesn't get to meet the Sultan often. But for the record, I too have talked about feudalism before. This was in a speech at the 51st Amno General Assembly, where I quoted Dato On Jaafar, where who said, interesting enough, that the concept of independence was not about reviving feudalism. The point has to be made that criticizing feudalism and calling for a change of mindset, and that this is essentially the thrust of Hussein's book, is not the same as advocating the abolition of the institution of the Malay rulers. And this is a very safe caveat, because there are many lawyers here. No one is calling for such a thing, even though we expect the speed doctors from the other side, Hutusan, of course, to be working over time to twist and turn our words. To Aziz, to Kusam Sul, beware. In terms of style, Dr. Said Hussein writes smoothly and concisely. The history of British colonization is summed up in just a few sentences. At page 9, we are told that, the, that after the 1874-1784 Treaty of Angkor, Raja Abdullah was recognized by the British as Sultan while Raja Ismail was made regent. But indeed, as there is no such thing as free lunch, Sultan Abdullah had to agree to accept a British resident to be advisor to the Sultan on all matters except religion, Islam, and Malay custom. And this is the part that sums up succinctly in one short sentence the history of how the British colonized the Malays. Quote, following Para, one after another of the Malay states fell under British domination. In every state, a British resident or advisor was appointed. This is history told in a no-nonsense fashion and truly illustrates the meaning of less is more. I won't cite for the excerpts which speak for themselves, but must be retold on this occasion since we have the audience and the medium. Dr. Said Hussein debunks the concept that the ruler is above the law and can do no wrong. This, he says, can be clearly seen from the ceremony of the installation of a ruler. There are two significant characteristics. First, the ruler takes the oath to be just. Secondly, he is positioned below a copy of the Holy Quran, symbolically placed on his head. Dr. Said Hussein contends that this means that the ruler is subject to and cannot override Allah's command as contained in the Quran. As explained by the author, 
Even though in theory the rulers do not take part in the administration of their states, several instances of conflicts with the political leaders in power stem directly from the interfering with the choice of the state's head of government. Convention dictates that the ruler acts on the advice of the Menteri Besar, but there is a lacuna here because the appointment of the Menteri Besar is in the hands of the ruler. Of course, the ruler does not have absolute power in this regard, but only discretionary power. He is to appoint as Menteri Besar someone who commands a majority in the State Legislative Assembly. That sounds elementary enough, but as we know, and as is well documented in the book, the reality has been quite different. And even more significant is the question of dissolution of the State Assembly when it is requested by the Menteri Besar. Must he accede to the request or can he just ignore the incumbent Menteri Besar and effectively sacking him, appoint a new Menteri Besar instead? We know what happened in Perak. Dr. Said Hussein supports the removal of the ruler's immunity from the law, but he questions why the political leaders in power are so reluctant to remove their own immunity. Why, for example, have so many politicians got away with murder, literally, to quote him. Now, at page 27, Dr. Said Hussein talks about the federal government taking action to introduce a code of ethics to govern the rulers. Indeed, at this juncture, juncture I can add some perspective into this account. Yes, in 1993, I led the delegation of senior AMNO leaders to meet Tuan Sultan Azlan Shah, who, as the Agung at that time, represented the Conference of Rulers. But later, in my discussion with Sultan Azlan, who represented uh, the rulers, and I was representing Amno, sadly enough to say. Uh, in my discussion with Sultan Azlan, while drafting the Code of Ethics, he expressed concern about the double standards of the political leaders. His concern was why were the Amno leaders harping on the rulers being involved in business, while they themselves, he cited clearly Daim, Zainuddin, were so deeply tied in business and enriching themselves. This is a crucial point, and it must be remembered that the support that was given to the government's initiative to curtail the protection of, of immunity of the rulers was predicated on the belief that there would be proper governance and the rule of law. These moves were supported by all sides, by us, and also by the opposition, including Said Hussein Ali at that time. On hindsight, it would appear we were indeed misled and taken advantage of. The expectations that we had held then were eventually shattered as a result of the greed, the powers that be. Terima kasih. Tani Ahskali kepada Said Hussein.